What has happened over the last number of years is that because of a lack of support from our governments for the creative sector, we tend to be quite reliant upon international donors. So the Goethe Institute, the French Institute, the um, British Council are pretty major supporters of the arts on our continent, as well as international donors based in Europe. And what tends to happen is that quite often we are introduced to particular concepts which might arise in or have primary relevance within a European context, and we tend to embrace them uncritically because of the resources attached to them. So rather than, you know, interrogate these things, we yesterday it was culture and development, the day before it was creative industries, the next day it's intercultural dialogue, the day after that it's climate change in the arts, and the day before, but you know what I mean? So every time these new concepts are introduced to us, we tend to think, okay, let's just panel beat our projects to now fit in with this particular new line so we can access the resources. So what I'm going to basically talk about now is, in a way, problematizing this notion of the creative industries from within an African context. Development, what is it? There are many definitions of development, but this one is taken from the United Nations Development Program. A process of economic growth, a rapid and sustained expansion of production, productivity, and income per head. So this is kind of an explanation of, or a definition of development that is quite often introduced to us, and we are told economic growth is paramount so you can have the resources in order to drive other forms of development. And the reason why you need to embrace creative industries in Africa is because of the contribution that they've made to the economies of Europe, for example, and they can do the same for you in your country and your uh, continent. So let's kind of test that. The top 10 countries according to GDP, um, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, you'll see them listed there. You'll notice that of those top 10, five of them are in North Africa. West and Southern Africa have two countries each, and then East Africa has one. Africa's share of the world's global, um, of the world's GDP is at about 2.3% at the moment. And um, UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, in the research that it did recently, kind of showed that Africa's share of the global creative economy stands at less than 1%. So it's, these figures are often kind of told to us that because of the low um, kind of share market share that you have, there's huge potential for the creative industries of Africa to basically drive economic development. But as I say, let's continue to test that. According to the IMF, the fastest growing economies, the 10 fastest growing economies in the first 10 years of this year were these ones. Angola, actually bigger than, faster than China, although coming off a significantly lower base. Then Myanmar, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kazakhstan, Chad, Mozambique, Cambodia, and Rwanda. So six of the 10 fastest growing economies are actually African economies, and that's over a 10-year period as opposed to a one-year period. The IMF projects that in the next five years, 2011 till 2015, till the realization of the, million, or the deadline for the MDGs, seven African countries will have the fastest growing economies out of the top 10. Ethiopia, Mozambique, Tanzania, Congo, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria. The top 10 countries according to per capita income, and these are 2010 figures, these are them here. Uh, you'll see the first column is the per capita income, so $12,420, and the second column is the number of people within that particular country. So, sorry, is there something, the problem? Is that better? Okay. Um, so, in terms of looking at potential markets, you might decide that people with an income of 12,420, um, that's quite significant, so maybe they'll have the disposable income to be able to support the creative industries. But then you realize they only have 700,000 people in that country, so in terms of size of market, it's not that significant. But when you compare those figures with Austria, for example, that rates number 11 or 12 on you know, world GDP, um, the average Austrian um, earns $42,000 on an annual basis. 3.5 times higher than the highest African country in terms of per capita income. Having given you those figures, these are the other side of it, that despite economic growth that has occurred in many of these countries, unemployment in Africa is incredibly high. So for example, there are a number of countries that have employment in excess of 50%. These include Namibia, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. In excess of 40%, that's Kenya, Senegal, Swaziland, 
And you'll see them there, all these countries in excess of those percentages. This is the rate of unemployment in those countries. The McKinsey report that was um, done about two years ago indicated that only 28% of Africans actually have stable wage paying jobs. The implication is that 72% of Africans are either unemployed or underemployed or make their living through the informal sector. One of the big stories about Africa in terms of um, its economic growth is the incredible levels of inequality. And this is not something peculiar to our region, it's something which has happened all over the world. I mean, the whole 1% you know, Occupy um, Wall Street campaign was around that, the, the 1% earns so much and the 99% um, earns a lot less. But some of the, some of the uh, figures here, Angola, the fastest growing economy for the first 10 years of this millennium, but more than 60% of its population lives on less than $2 a day. In Equatorial Guinea, the highest per capita income um, but 75% of the people live below the poverty threshold. 30% of them plus are unemployed. In South Africa, um, our government's own National Planning Commission did a diagnostic study of the state of um, distribution of income recently. And in their report, they showed that the wealthiest 20% earn 70% of the national income. The poorest 20% earn 2.3% of the national income. 50% of people who are employed in our country earn 250 euros or less per month. So what are some of the conclusions we can draw about development as economic growth or economic growth as development? First, despite significant economic growth, most Africans be live below the poverty line, are unemployed in a formal sense and survive through the informal sector. The second conclusion is that growth is not necessarily the problem. So telling us that we need to embrace creative industries in order to drive growth that's not really what the issue is. The issue is that the wealth that is generated happens to be concentrated within an elite and that development then, many people do not benefit from that economic growth in terms of the development agenda. Um, and the third minor conclusion is that if other economic sectors such as resources, oil is a big driver of economic growth in certain countries at the moment, if that with the high growth, growth rates do not lead to the kind of development that we all would like for the continent, then it's highly unlikely that the creative industries will actually do that. So there's another definition here from the UNDP of development as human development. It's a long one, but I'm not going to go into it. But basically, in terms of the summary, the object of development in terms of this paradigm is that the basic purpose of development is to enlarge people's choices. The objective is to create an enabling environment for people to enjoy long, healthy and creative lives. And these come from the two co-founders, the Pakistani and the Indian co-founders of the Human Development Index. The Human Development Index measures life expectancy, education and income in every country and they have a ranking. And in terms of this ranking, countries kind of fit into four categories, either very high human development, high human development, medium human development or low human development. Now, in terms of this, 36 African countries or 66% of the African countries that we have on our continent are in the low human development category. In fact, the bottom 15 are African countries and then you get Afghanistan um, above them. 12 are in the medium category and then three are in the high um, human development category. There's no African country in the very high human development category. Interestingly, Libya is rated the highest African country in terms of the human development index. So in terms of life expectancy, access to education, um, literacy, those kinds of things, you could live a very decent life in Libya, according to the HDI. But of course, the limitations of the Human Development Index um, kind of showed in the overthrow of the Gaddafi government, um, because maybe these particular indicators are good at a certain level, but they did not take account of the desire of people for other fundamental freedoms and other fundamental human rights. Similarly, other highly ranked African countries like um, um, Tunisia and Algeria also have quite limited human rights and freedoms, unlike Mauritius, which is probably billed as the, as the best democracy on the African continent. Some would then argue that growth in Africa must take precedence over democracy, um, kind of arguing that in the context, say, of North Africa, um, you know, it, it, we shouldn't 
well, basically what, what, what they were saying here is that quite often countries in Africa are kind of sold, told you must respect human rights, you must um, respect democracy, um, but actually people see that as an impediment to economic growth and they say, well, look at the Chinese model, the Chinese are not exactly a paragon of democracy or human rights and look how it's working for them. They, in fact, have lifted 600 million people out of poverty over the last 30 years. So let's look a little bit at China in Africa. What does China do? Trade between China and Africa has kind of grown from one billion in 1980, one billion dollars, to 10 billion in the year 2000, 114 billion 10 years later, and last year, 33% growth, even on that figure, to 166 billion dollars worth of trade. They are now the largest trading partner with Africa, the USA next, and then France. More than 800 Chinese companies operate on the continent, investing in roads, railways, mines, agriculture, information, communication, technology, and the like. In July, they opened another $20 billion credit line to Africa, investment in hard infrastructure. They're building airports in Kenya, Ghana, a new port in Ghana, um, and the like. But there's also the soft investment from China. They built the new complex for the African Union in Addis Ababa, a very you know, fantastic building apparently in Addis Ababa that now houses the African Union. They are building a new ministerial complex in Liberia. Um, they are engaged in peacekeeping in Sudan. They have spent money on agricultural research in Mozambique and have instituted a poverty reduction, a re reduction center in, in Mozambique to basically teach them how they've gone about reducing poverty in rural areas in China and how they should be doing it in Mozambique as well. They are training railway technicians and people to do with railways in Nigeria. There are hundreds of Africans who have been trained in Chinese universities from a whole range of African countries, including recent graduates from Equatorial Guinea, Congo, and Angola. But also, with regard to culture, China is very active. Um, they engage in what some people caricature as stadium diplomacy. We all know that building big stadiums ultimately don't deliver very much because I know from our 2010 World Cup experience, a lot of those stadiums stand empty. So China kind of builds these because they know that Africans love soccer and you know, they need these stadiums and they know that there's no return on the investment, but it's part of building up good relations. They build cultural spaces. Um, the big new national cultural center in Senegal was built by the Chinese. Uh, they're building a museum in Nigeria. They have Confucius centers um, that teach the Mandarin language, that promote Chinese culture in more than, in more than 16 countries across the continent at the moment. There are cultural exchanges, festival ex exhibitions, that are increasingly happen, happening between China and Africa. Some of the differences between the approach of China to the West is that China kind of invests hugely in hard and soft in infrastructure currently, driving both the Chinese economy and the economy of African countries. The second kind of quite interesting point is that there's very little interference, in fact, no interference. It's a very strong point of theirs in the political affairs of the countries in which they operate. So if they're there are no kind of human rights or democracy conditionality, whatever that word is. <laughs> um, you know, so, so, which I suppose is quite similar to what the West's attitude to Tunisia and Egypt was at the time of their dictators, that as long as you're serving our geopolitical interests and our economic interests, human rights didn't really matter very much until the people said, well, this is the tipping point. And then, of course, we all became great supporters of democracy in North Africa. Um, the primary means of cultural engagement you have from the unique side, French Institute, British Council, Goethe Institute, and then of course you've now got the Confucius centers playing quite a similar role on behalf of um, China. Democracy and human rights in Africa. Freedom House NGO based in America um, kind of uses a whole bunch of criteria to determine whether countries are free, partly free, or um, not free at all. And you'll see the categories there. But what I was just wanting to point out was in the 2011 survey, kind of showed that only nine African countries are considered to be free. Uh, 23 partly free and 23 are considered to be not free, where political pluralism, free and fair elections, political and civil liberties are not really respected. So interestingly, four of the six fastest growing economies on our continent are considered to be not free, um, two partly free. What is also interesting is that four of the ten, the other four fastest growing economies in the world are also countries that are considered not free. China, Cambodia, Myanmar, and so on. So there might very well be support for this argument that in order to drive economic growth, 
you need to have countries that are centrally controlled where there's little respect for democracy and human rights. On the other hand, you have my country, South Africa, that you know, is, has been a poster child for democracy. We've had four free, free and fair elections. You've got um, great constitutional guarantees of freedom of expression and the like. And yet, over the last number of years, employment has increased to be at an all-time high. You've got very high levels of inequality, the Gini coefficient kind of showing that South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. And life expectancy has actually declined from the days of apartheid to now. So it's kind of been very interesting that democracy is not necessarily a guarantee of great development either. Arteal Network, the organization that I used to be part of, well, I still am part of, but not in a leadership capacity anymore, kind of defines um, development based on this kind of analysis as the ongoing generation and application of financial, human infrastructural resources to create the optimal conditions in which human beings enjoy the full range of human rights and freedoms enshrined in the Declaration of Human Rights. The relationship between culture and development then for us is that cult development, however you define it, is actually an act of culture because development is based on particular ideological assumptions, on values and beliefs, assuming that another community or society needs to be developed. So it's based on particular kind of cultural values. Insofar as development acts on those beneficiaries, it's disruptive of the cultures of those beneficiaries and helps to reshape, shift their beliefs, traditions and the like. Development, if it is to facilitate human rights, then it needs to also take cognizance of Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that states everyone shall have the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts. So the fundamental human rights says the arts are not a luxury to be given after you've looked after housing, etc., but it's for people to enjoy all of these things simultaneously because people are not only physical beings, they have emotional, spiritual, intellectual needs as well. And then finally, of course, creative products in terms of global exchange and trade, as Yvonne was saying earlier, have embedded within them values, ideas, beliefs, and ideological assumptions. So that if we simply allowed the market to dominate, then it would be creative products from dominant economies that would flood our markets. We would then watch our television, play the music, and imbibe the values inherent in them. And so the world will become homogenized and we'll all begin to think like Americans do or like Austrians do or like French do. And this is why the important part of the convention is about countries having the right to look after their own creative industries, to invest in them, and so that their citizens have choice between that which comes from Hollywood and from Europe, but also from within their own country as well. The UNESCO convention promotes creative industries of the global south. It encourages investment in these industries by countries from the global north. And it also provides for prefer preferential access to the global north markets for creative goods and services from the south. I'm not going to go through this very, just very quickly. If you then look at the creative industries in an African context um, and the value chain, education and training, creation, production, distribution and consumption, very few institutions where people can learn about the arts and be trained as artists but even fewer institutions where people can learn about the business of the arts, how to translate talent into income streams. In terms of creation, we've got an incredibly fantastic pool of raw talent, but many of those talented artists migrate from outside, outside of the continent because there isn't the infrastructure to support the development and distribution of their work. In terms of production, some countries have them, but generally there's an absence of startup capital, poor infrastructure for artists in terms of studios, rehearsal space, recording studios and the like, distribution, a lack of galleries, a lack of theatres, but a high number of quite weak festivals. They are, we counted there are more than 600 festivals on the continent. We just created an African festival network and at the time of launching there were 155 members. Consumption, and this is the key point about creative industries on in our continent, given the high levels of unemployment and the lack of disposable income, the markets to sustain creative industries on the continent simply are not there. But if they are, then they want to have access to creative goods and services at prices that they can afford, and hence the piracy that occurs on our continent. So, for example, in Nollywood produces a fantastic number of DVDs every week, the second highest number of films after India, but for every one DVD produced, 
nine of them are pirated. So for me, we need to move from a creative industries kind of approach to a creative sector approach, because essentially there are three areas of artistic production which are all valid within an African context. There is art for its own sake, because it has merit and value in its own right, because it helps with personal catharsis and personal growth, and it celebrates freedom of creative expression, whether there's a major audience for it or not. It needs to be supported. Secondly, given the conditions in which many Africans live, art for socially good ends, incredibly important. The instrumentalization of the arts to encourage and teach people about sanitation issues, about health issues, about the abuse of women and the like. Incredibly important. We cannot say do not instrumentalize the arts in our context because actually given the conditions in which most of our people live, that kind of art is incredibly necessary. And then of course, the creative industries and art for commercial profit has a completely valid role as well. And it is when we kind of juxtapose these things against each other and say that one over that one, that really we create unnecessary tensions. What we need to recognize is that within African conditions, all three of these have validity. And you may have an artist participating in all of these in one week because tonight is taking part in a particular play at a commercial theater. Tomorrow is engaged in a particular um, educational project around HIV AIDS. And artists don't see a difference between these things because they work across all three of these sectors. And then can the creative industries help Africa to flourish? And this is, I'm coming to my conclusion now. African conditions with regard to value chains, markets, disposable income, understanding of, and political will for the creative industries, they are vastly different um, to that which you experience in, in Europe, for example. The UNESCO Convention, investment in and opening of markets by the global north, it's nowhere near the scale that is really required for the development of creative industries in our continent. And then, of course, the countries that are most in need of development, as we understand it, um, are more likely to invest in hard development and countries with the GDP and markets, the CI's creative industries are most likely to benefit the elites there rather than um, the majority of people. So again, the conclusion, rather than models and strategies that are appropriate to Western democracies, for example, the creative industries, or models and strategies that work for China, such as high growth, low democracy, if the end of development is people and their well-being, their fundamental freedoms and human rights, then we need to be, or we need to create informed, multi-layered, holistic development approaches that are appropriate to the African conditions that vary both within and between regions and countries. So thank you.